If you'd like to turn in your Bibles this morning, turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 9, verse 9 is where we're going to start. We're starting a new series this morning entitled, The Process of Discipleship. I consider my number one job is making disciples. I remember a few years ago I was listening to a lecture by a Christian author and he gave what I thought was a scathing but very accurate critique of the American church. He said, and he was speaking to a group of ministers, he said, we have become very good at making church members. When God called us to make disciples. Now, to be a good church member, I'll tell you all that you've got to do. If you show up on a regular basis, if you volunteer for one or more jobs, if you give financially, generally people will look at you and say, that's a good church member. But you know, a lot of people can do that. So what we're going to be looking at the next few weeks is the process of discipleship. And the first step is to explore. I get things in the mail all the time. Go and take a cruise here. And they show me all these fascinating places to go. Europe, the Caribbean, the Mediterranean, Australia. You notice they never invite you to go to the cesspools in the world. I haven't got one yet. It said, come see beautiful Iraq. But we are invited. And this morning, I want, when we look at this first step of exploring, I want to look at the fact that Jesus has invited us to explore what life is like with him. Let's read the text this morning. It's found in Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. It says, As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, Follow me. So he arose and followed him. Now it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house that behold many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciple, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard that, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. If you were at work tomorrow... And someone came where you were at, and they said to you, Come, follow me. What would you do? Now, we're not told here, but there was a strong implication that Matthew knew who Jesus was. 
he's already fairly famous. What would you do in that situation? When we look at this invitation, we see, first of all, that Christ invites us to follow him. As I said, our goal is to make disciples because that's what Jesus commanded us to do. In the great commandment, he said, go ye therefore and make disciples. Disciples of Jesus Christ. Just who are disciples? Well, disciples, first thing, are invited, as we see here, to come and follow Jesus. They're invited And Jesus has given all of us an invitation. How do we know that? Because of what it says in John chapter 3. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish. Well, guess what? You're in that whosoever. You're in that group. That Jesus has extended an invitation to you to come and follow him. Now here's the thing. The invitation comes regardless of status. Nobody has ever liked tax collectors. For those of you who haven't filed your taxes, April the 15th is fast approaching. I think it may be extended a day or two this year because of the way the 15th falls. But anyway, you know it's coming. Ancient Israel despised tax collectors. If you were in a court and you called a tax collector as a witness, a tax collector was, had the same status as a thief or a murderer. In other words, their testimony was not going to win the case for you because nobody trusted them. And so Matthew and his friends, because the only friends that a tax collector would have were other tax collectors. Common, ordinary, decent people, if they saw them coming down the street, would walk over to the other side. They would not speak to them in public, except on that one occasion when they had to go and pay their taxes And they found out how much they owed. And that was their only conversation they had with these people. Jesus here creates a scandal among the religious community. Because Jesus goes to a tax collector... Not to pay taxes, but to invite him to be one of his disciples? No doubt the other disciples were thinking, what has he gotten us into? You know the way the church has become a lot of times? I saw this the other day when I was at a car wash And it was one of those automated car washes, and they had a sign there. And it said, if your vehicle has a lot of mud, don't come here. Unfortunately, that's the way a lot of churches are. If you've got a lot of sin, don't come here. If you got just a little bit of sin that we can wipe off and brush away, then that's okay. Jesus isn't that way. 
Jesus is, I don't care what kind of sin you've got. My blood is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. Paul would say it like this on one occasion. He says, where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. The only thing that it compares to is in the Old Testament. You remember one time when the prophet um, Elisha was surrounded by an army that had come in to invade Israel. And they had Elisha surrounded and Elisha's servant was looking at all the troops, and no matter where he looked, he saw that they were surrounded, and he said, Elisha, what are we going to do? And Elisha said, pray to prayer, Lord, open his eyes. And God opened the eyes of his servants, and he looked, and he saw that while he and Elisha were surrounded by the enemy, beyond the enemy, and as you know, as you go out further, the ring gets bigger. It was an army of an angelic host that had surrounded them. That's the way your sin is. You may look at it sometimes and say, my sin is so great. It's almost like, God, open your eyes where you can see that no matter where your sin is, and you may look sometimes and find that it's surrounded but just beyond your sin is grace that is, as Paul says, super abounding. No, there is not a sin that God cannot deal with. I know I've talked with people and I've had them confess various things to me. And I've seen the reaction from different people sometime and they confess things and I can tell by the way that they're saying it that what they think and what they expect from me is, as soon as I say this, as soon as I tell you what I've done, you're going to tell me to leave because you just don't want to have anything to do with me anymore. And I found it always astounds them because I still sit there and say, okay, is that all? Like, no matter how big you may think it is, I know there's something bigger out there that God has. So what does Matthew do? Matthew rises and follows. He follows. He leaves everything behind. It's like he's looking at it. He's understanding that Jesus has given him something that the ordinary world will not give you. Once the world decide is, decides that you're no good, there's nothing that you can do. Some of us experience that with family and friends. Once they've made a decision on you, once they've made a judgment on you, once they've passed judgment on you it doesn't matter what you do and you feel like sometimes there's nothing I can do Jesus here is giving Matthew a whole new opportunity to leave the world that has been despised and to go and do something new The message of the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about giving us new life. As Paul would say, old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Jesus here is showing us. Hey, it applies to tax collectors. And what happens after that? We see that evidently there was an extended invitation because not only, because the next thing that we see is not just Matthew following Jesus, but we find that 
Jesus is sitting with many tax collectors and sinners. Now, why does God reach out to people who are deep in sin? Because that's where the sinners are. You find someone that's involved in sin, all their friends are sinners. I'll be honest with you. I don't have many friends that we would call deep, dark sinners. I remember years ago when we had just moved into a house in Georgia, and I'd taken a position at a church, and uh, one afternoon I was back there and I started talking with one of the neighbors. And uh, he started talking to me, and we're just having this friendly conversation, and I'm getting all kinds of invitations. Hey, you need to come over to our house sometime, and, you know... We're going to open up a keg of beer and all this kind of stuff. And I'm sitting there going, uh -huh, yeah. And I thought, well, I'm just going to do a little experiment here just to see what happens. After we had talked about 30 minutes and everything, and I've been friendly and he's been friendly, I finally said, well, what do you do for a living? And he told me what he did. And, of course, I knew what was going to happen next. What do you do? Oh, I'm uh, on staff over here at one of the churches. and You're on staff? What do you do there? Oh, I'm one of the pastors there. You know, within 60 seconds, the conversation had ended. He was gone. I never found out the date of the keg party. In fact, we lived there for seven years. I never talked with a guy again. I don't know if he watched out his window. Oh, he's out there. I can't go outside. When people find out who I am and what I do, I mean, it's like that. It will. My contact with sinners dries up real quick. But if you want to reach sinners, you got to have sinners. It's like one guy I heard one time said, if you want to have a revival in your church, you better fill it up with sinners first. So, Jesus is sitting with tax collectors and sinners and the implication is that Matthew has invited all his friends, and all his friends are tax collectors and sinners, not the best people in the world. They were not up there on the high social status. And Jesus is sitting there with them, and what happens? The Pharisees disapprove. Now, the Pharisees... Now, I want to be honest with you this morning. I would make a good Pharisee. I've got all the elements that they were looking for when they were saying, we want someone to be a Pharisee. What are they looking for? Well, here, here were the requirements of the Pharisees. They were looking for someone who had a deep love of the Word of God. Oh, okay. Do that. They were looking for someone who wanted to live a holy life before God that was pleasing to God. Okay, yeah, I qualify. They were looking for someone who was looking at that time for the coming of the Messiah. Yeah. They were also a group that believed very strongly, as opposed to the Sadducees, in the miracle working power of God. That was your typical Pharisee. The problem with the Pharisees.
they were looking for the Messiah, but they basically did all their plots and schemes and charts and everything to try and figure out what the Messiah would look like. And then Jesus came and they didn't recognize him because he didn't fit their expectations. They were like the car wash. If you've got a lot of mud, don't come here. We'll clean you up a little bit, but not a lot. The Pharisees disapprove because the Pharisees are not focusing on the things that matter to God, like grace and mercy and forgiveness, because they're focused on the things that we refer to now as legalism. And if you're asking, well, what is legalism? I hear a lot of people talking about that. I'm just going to give you a little shorthand definition of legalism this morning. Legalism is when you think you can do things and God will owe you. Now, that's how I know that I would make a good Pharisee because I have prayed those kind of prayers in the past. And you tell me if maybe you've prayed something like this. Have you ever been going through a bad week and you've been thinking, God, why is this happening to me? I've been doing everything right. That's legalism. Because you think, I've been doing everything right. God, you owe me a good life. If I do everything right, then my life should read, and he lived happily ever after. That's called a fairy tale. It's not real life. When you do good things, occasionally you're going to find out that you're going to get attacked. And if you've got a legalistic side of you, you're going to think, that's not fair. Yeah, I agree with you. It's not fair. And so the Pharisees here, they're disapproving. Jesus is sitting in that house with that crowd? And they're, of course, they're talking to the other disciples. They don't go and confront Jesus. But they go and confront the other disciples. You're following that guy? But Jesus hears it. And don't you... Love his reply to that crowd. He just says, and I've paraphrased it here a little bit. Jesus' reply is, sick people need doctors. When you're well, you don't wake up in the morning and say, oh, I need to go see the doctor today. Unless you've got a checkup or something like that. And then you're usually, uh, oh, they don't find anything. But generally, sick people are the ones that need doctors. And sinners need Jesus. Jesus understood that. Just as sick people need doctors, sinners need Jesus. Yet someone that's got a big sin problem in their life, what's the answer? Jesus. That's what they need. They can do everything else, and there are a lot of good things that you can do in the world. You can go to counseling, and that can help you address and identify your issues. But the bottom line thing is, if you've got a problem with sin, you need Jesus. Because Jesus is the only one that can deal with your problem. And Matthew understands that. It's like, wow, this guy is different than everybody else. And so basically he's having a party at his house. He invites all of his friends. And we see that happening throughout the New Testament. You remember in John where it talks about the woman at the well that Jesus has a conversation with. And she comes and invites everybody. Hey, you've got to come and see this guy. He's different. The guy that was healed by the pool when Jesus prayed for him and he was healed and 
he was doing things, and the Pharisees got on to him and said, Hey, you're breaking the Sabbath rules. You're doing all the things wrong. He said, All I know is the guy that healed me told me to do this, and I'm not listening to you guys. You know, you can tell me all your fancy little rules and all of that, but the guy that healed me, I'm going to pay attention to him. And the guy that saves your soul, pay attention to him. Then we come to Jesus isn't through with them. He starts to teach them something about God that they've, with all of their study, they missed out on. And that is, they know they're experts in the law, but they really don't understand what God was trying to say. And Jesus gives them this little verse over in Hosea. And the first part of that verse is, I desire mercy. Because mercy is the language of God. Even when you read in the Old Testament, which a lot of people like to think, well, the Old Testament is law and the New Testament is grace. And that is a terrible interpretation. Because if you read the New Te Old Testament, you will find there's just as much grace in the Old Testament as there's law. And if you read the New Testament, you're going to find there's just as much law as there was in the Old Testament. Now, some of the rules have changed. That's true. We don't have to sacrifice animals anymore. We don't have to follow dietary laws. But guess what? Sin is still sin. Old Testament or New Testament, wrong is still wrong. And so he says here, God said, I desire mercy because mercy is the language of God. What do we mean by that? God first desire toward us is not to punish us. If God's first desire was to punish us, then back in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve, and Eve had sinned, God would have just killed them, wiped them out, and started over again because, guess what, there was plenty of dirt around. But He didn't. Why? Because He's merciful. And he wants to show us mercy. Mercy is the language of God. But mercy is a language that the Pharisees do not know how to speak. And that's why we in the church sometimes need to remind ourselves, what language are we speaking? Are our words tinged with mercy? Are our goals, goals of mercy? Now what's amazing is the second part of this verse. Because he said, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Now why does he say that? Not sacrifice because sacrifice is often a cover. Oh, we know how to speak the language. We know how to do the right stuff. We know how to cover our own faults. We know how to cover our own sins. We know how to cover things up. And how do we do that? Sacrifice. Oh, I'm going to sacrifice to God. That was Saul's answer when Samuel came to him and he said, basically, Saul, God gave you a command. Go and kill these people and kill all their animals and do everything. Don't let anything live when dealing with the Amalekites. And Saul said, well, you know, they had a lot of good stuff. And we thought we'd offer a big sacrifice to God. He'll understand. And of course, we're going to keep some of it for ourselves. But we'll give God a portion. 
And Samuel looked at him and shook his head, and he said, that's not the way God works. You cannot cover up your disobedience with sacrifice. An interesting footnote to that is that later on when Saul is killed, and there are two different stories about it, so we don't know if he fell on his sword or if he had someone to assist him. We're not sure exactly what happened. But we do know that one person left the scene of Saul's death and went and told David about Saul dying, and he claimed credit for helping to kill Saul. And David looked at him and said, Who are you? And he just said, I'm an Amalekite. The very people that Saul was ordered to kill, and he let live. So, sacrifice is often a cover. That's why God's not interested in how much you've given or how much you've done. Again, Jesus would tell the story of a Pharisee and a sinner of how they were down at the altar praying and the sinner went down there and he said, God, have mercy on me. And the Pharisee looked over at the sinner and he said, God, I thank you that I'm not like this guy over here. I fast so many times. I, I give tithes. I do this and I do that. And God, you're so lucky to have me instead of this person over here. And Jesus said, God, listen to the sinner and not the Pharisee. You see, we cover up things by our actions sometimes. When God's looking on the heart. And if in your heart you ask God for mercy, guess what? God wants to give you mercy. If you're dealing with stuff in your past, you think, I don't see how anybody could forgive me. God can. If you're dealing with things in your past that you're ashamed of and in case you didn't know it, I'll clue you all in. We all have stuff that we're ashamed of. We all have things that we've done in the past that if we put them on a screen up here today, you would just sit there and you'd be like, oh, God. How can I be confident of saying that? Because I know what Paul said. Paul said, we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all in the same boat, sinners. The only difference is some of us have sinned a little and some of us have sinned a lot. As one of my teachers was fond of saying, you can't say it's your end of the boat that's taking on water. We're in the boat together. We all have the same need. We all need a Savior. So God says, I deal in mercy. I'm not weighing how many sacrifices you've given. I'm not weighing all the good deeds that you've done. I'm not weighing all the money that you've given. I'm not weighing all whatever tool of measurement God measures the heart. And God looks at the heart. And that's why in the Old Testament he would look at Israel sometimes and they would be offering up sacrifices. And the part of the way that they would do sacrifices is they had spices and different things that would just give off when they were burned. These very fragrant aromas. You know, ladies, you love that stuff. I know like Sheila does, she has candles sometimes that she burns in the house. And it's like, she says, oh, this smells so good. And that's what the Israelites were doing. Oh, we're going to burn this candle here. And we're going to offer this spice. And oh, it's going to smell good to God. And the prophet said... God said, I smell that, and it stinks. Not because it smells bad, but because God says, I see your heart. It stinks. It was a cover, and not a very good one. 
And why are we so interested in covering? Because that's what we've been doing ever since Adam and Eve. You know, when Adam and Eve heard God, God coming in the Garden of Eden, and, you know, their first response is they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. We're always trying to cover ourselves with things that are totally inadequate. And God gives us a hint in the Garden of Eden about what it's going to take because he doesn't. He sort of looks at the fig leaves and says, that's not going to work. And God took some animals and slew them and covered them with animal skins. And that's the first indication that we have of a blood sacrifice that we talked about last week with Easter and Good Friday and the sacrifice of Jesus. That if you're, the only thing that's going to cover your sin is blood. And the blood of animals isn't sufficient. And the blood of another human being isn't sufficient. The only blood that was good enough to cover you was the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why he came. So we come down then into this last point, and that is what Jesus was trying to get across to them is that God would rather give than take. God looks to give. When you're struggling in life, God wants to give you a chance. As Matthew is sitting there, and probably people had told Matthew, well, this, hey, you've made decisions. This is your life. There's nothing that you can do. Nobody will ever treat you differently. Nobody will ever speak to you outside of your friends that you've gotten. And then Jesus comes along. And he says, you don't have to sit here anymore. Come, follow me. This first step of discipleship is answering the invitation of Jesus to go and explore a new life. That's what he's given us, a new life. A new way of doing things, a new way of living, a new way, everything. As Paul said, all things are passed away. All things are new. That's what he's given you newness of life God already knows how bad you can be he knows it and he says I love you anyway I love you anyway I love you anyway And sometimes we wonder, why does he love us? Don't know. I've never thought of a good reason why God loves us. He just does. And that's just something that we can build in our life. God loves me. Why? I don't know. Doesn't matter. What matters is God loves me. And so he invites you to take a new journey, to take a new walk, to enter into a new life. That's the first step of discipleship. To get out of your seat when Jesus says, come and follow me and say, I'm following this guy. I will follow him. And Matthew would follow him for the rest of his life. The only thing he took with him was a pen where he could write the gospel that we just read from. The gospel of Matthew. This is the one little section in the gospel where Matthew is just sort of telling his friends and family and enemies and everybody else, look what happened to me. This is how my life changed. Jesus changed my life. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you this morning for your grace and your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've given us today. And Lord, I just pray for anyone here this morning who may be struggling with stuff in their life, that they would realize 
that you are a merciful God, that you desire mercy, that you desire us to ask for mercy, that you desire to give us mercy. And Lord, we just thank you for that today.